Neeraj, please start. Yes, yes, we are starting. Give me one second. I have to update on the Ortho TV website. Who can run? It's already started. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. We welcome you all to Ortho TV Online dot com, the first ASSI webinar on odontoid fractures. Before the we start the webinar, we would like to just display our disclaimer. We would like to thank all our faculty for sharing their knowledge through this and expertise with all, especially in such challenging times. We wish all our audience a healthy and safe days ahead, and we hope these webinars add value to your time. These webinars are dependent on internet speed, which might be at times unstable. Please bear with us for any issues with the internet. Kindly go through the disclaimer. So, good evening again, and we welcome the SSI team with us, and uh, the moderator, Dr. Gautam Zaveri, to kindly take over. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this inaugural series of the A or inaugural episode of the SSI Master Series. the association of spinal surgeons of india would like to start this master series of webinars which will be deal with complex topics in spinal pathology in dealing with spinal pathology spinal surgeon this seminar will be held once a month on the first sunday between 4 pm to 6 pm the format of the session like today will be an interactive case discussion session and interspersed will be specific lectures or videos to show techniques of surgery along with pulls and pitfalls today the topic for discussion is odontoid or c2 fractures we have got a very very eminent panel of doctors from across the country who are going to enlighten you on various aspects of including the anatomy the biomechanics uh, patient selection various surgical techniques for odontoid fractures with us we have dr ajay shetty from the ganga hospital in coimbatore who is going to lead the interactive case discussion session we have dr rudrappa satish from bangalore neurosurgeon from bangalore dr vishal kundani from the lilavati and the bombay hospital in mumbai Dr. Shitit Chaudhary of the Reliance H N Hospital in Mumbai, and amongst the panelists we have Dr. S K Shrivastava, head of department of K E M Hospital, Mumbai; Dr. Vijay Kumar, neurosurgeon from Kolkata; Dr. Shashank Kale, head of department of the All India Institute of Medical Sciences in New Delhi; Dr. Bharat Dave of the Stavya Hospital in Ahmedabad, and Dr. Sajesh Menon, who comes from Cochin. So. without much ado let me hand over the mic to dr uh, ajoy ajoy and request him to take over the proceedings from now sorry ah uh, good evening to everybody thank you gautam for uh, uh, taking charge of this initiative as you know that today's topic will be odontoid fractures and gautam has already introduced the panelists and also uh, the surgeons who are going to demonstrate the video and the technical tips i'll just start with a brief introduction the upper cervical spine is also called as cranio cervicum or the oc1 c2 it is characterized by the absence of the disc and the shallow joints and hence the majority of the stability is provided by the ligaments and the joint capsules as you can see the transverse ligament stabilizes the central atlanto axial joint the apical and the alar ligament along with the capsules provide rotation and translation stability the unique anatomy with the odontoid acting as a peg allows the c1 c2 to contribute to significant amount of rotation of the cervical spine and about 40 degrees of rotation happens between c1 and c2 as we all know the traumatic ligament test injury have got a poor prognosis for healing whereas the bony injuries usually respond well to non surgical management 
with the exception being the type 2 odontoid fractures. The blood supply of the odontoid comes from the virtual artery, from the anterior ascending and the posterior ascending artery. And it was always presumed that there is a watershed zone in the zone 2 of the odontoid or the waist of the odontoid. And that was one of the reasons, uh, the, thought to be the main reason for non-union following type 2 odontoid fractures. However, angiographic studies have shown that this is one study done by Dr. Govinder, where then he performed a DSA in 18 patients. The anterior ascending branch of the virtual artery was always cut, whereas the posterior ascending branch of the virtual artery was intact, and the odontoid blood supply was not affected, and they did post-mortem study on certain patients. There was no evidence of AVN. Therefore, the factors now currently understanding to contribute to non-union are the low bone density, less bone trabeculae, cortical bone, less surface area, and also the fracture gap in the synovial fluid. We also know that there's a less incidence of neurological deficit in the upper cervical spine injury. Either the injury is very severe where the individual might die and spot. It's basically because of the Steele's rules of third, wherein there is one third of the subarachnoid space is empty, and therefore it gives movement, chance of movement for the cord and the chance of neurological deficit is less. Having said that, we'll come into the wooden tire fractures. It amounts to about 10 to 15% of the cervical spine injury. It can happen in the end where the treatment is well-defined, whereas in the elderly, it can happen following trivial trauma, but the management is still debated. We are going to discuss about that. And this is a commonly missed injury uh, most of the time, and therefore a high index of suspicion is necessary in this group of patients, especially who are uh, polytraumatized, head injury, unconscious. I think a CT scan is necessary in these scenarios. We know the classification of uh, odontide, the type 1, type 2, and the type 3, whereas the type 2 contributing about 60% of the odontide fractures. Also important to understand that type 2 is further classified by Gruer et al. into type 2A, which is non-displaced, type 2B, which could be a displaced transverse or a fracture which is going from anterior superior to posterior inferior, and type uh, two subclass C, wherein the fracture pattern is from the uh, anterior inferior to the posterior superior. Sorry, it's wrong, uh, this thing. And uh, they need uh, C1, C2 stabilization. We start the case discussion first with a two-year-old child with a type two rentide fracture. The child had a history of fall from the swing. And following the fall, the child had no movements in the lower limbs and the upper limb. But gradually, within 24 hours, the child recovered a significant amount of movement, apart from weakness in both the hands. This was the radiograph done elsewhere. We do not do a flexion extension radiograph in the immediate scenario. And this is the CT scan and the MRI picture. These are all the pictures what is available with us right now. Vijay, in this scenario, how do you differentiate between the separation of the ossification center and a fracture? Or is it necessary? Does it have a row? Uh, decision making uh, thing um, vijay kumar yeah i'm i'm not sure that yeah it is necessary to distinguish whether it is a separation or not but on a ct scan with reconstruct often you'll be able to see the uh, ossification center as as sort of a lucent zone um, on this particular uh, scan it actually looks like a fracture rather than a rather than an epiphyseal uh, displacement yeah? okay then what will be a management in a situation like this? The child is neurologically improving. There is yeah. a probably a fracture, uh, like odontide fracture. There is subluxation anteriorly, but it had a significant neurology, but it improved with the residual weakness of C8 and T1. In the children, what are the things you consider when you are planning treatment or uh, in this particular scenario? Okay, the few things that uh, one would take into the algorithm are, uh, you know, that children by and large uh, heal well, but obviously it is difficult to immobilize uh, children, uh, you know, uh, relatively easily. But at the same time, consider the fact that the bones are all of small size. So to think of a surgical intervention in a small child is also not, uh, you know, an easy uh, task in that sense. So one of the common algorithms that we would use for pediatric spinal injuries in any case is Number one, is it reducible? And does the uh, uh, reduction also reduce the uh, neurology? So in this case, as you have said, 
that the child um, spontaneously improved um, after an initial period of uh, weakness. Um, and, you know, this looks like uh, the fracture can be relatively easily manipulated into a good position um, with the child awake itself. And then my personal plan would have been to actually immobilize the child in a halo vest. Um, children are remarkably adaptable to halo vest immobilization. Um, you know, within a few days, they are kind of running around and doing all sorts of uh, naughty things again, even with a halo vest in place. Okay. Uh Satish, would you agree to the plan of management or would you think of anything else? No, that because I'm... I... Hello? Yeah, Hello? No, no. Now that uh, lecture, so I better <laughs> want to comment on this next time. On... Yes, I will. Okay, sure. Uh, what we did was basically a posterior sublaminar wire fixation with a small amount of local graft and uh, it went on to uh, heal quite well. The child did have mild degree of weakness in CHC1. Uh, just uh, as you said, the basically is reducible and therefore it depends on your uh, decision how to stabilize it either by a halo vest or a simple procedure like a uh, sublaminar so, wiring institution also. Uh, for personally speaking, I always go for a surgical uh, stabilization either with a, uh, with a wires or a uh, even uh, the seven-year-old child, we can use a small uh, lateral mass screws to stabilize, uh, stabilize it posteriorly. Okay. So uh, I prefer uh, uh, surgical stabilization rather than a halo because it is very difficult to manage these children uh, with the uh, halo vest, especially in our country where it is too hot and all. They are not very much uh, in tolerating that kind of treatment. Okay. Thank you. We'll move on to a next case, a 35-year-old patient. Point to make here. Uh, yeah, Vishal. Yeah, Vishal here. So yeah. basically, in, you know, it, it's it's easy to stabilize these kids surgically. In fact, it is, it is seen that, uh, you know, we have also done a study that the feasibility of fixation by any kind of implant happens. Anatomical feasibility is possible right from the age of two and a half years onwards. Even a 2.7 yeah. millimeter screw can easily be passed like a transarticular screw. Wiring can be used. But, but my concern is that these kids, it has been noted in our own study also, and there are enough articles to say that C1, C2 fusion done before 13 years of age results into higher incidence of swan neck deformities. So my concern is that these kids, which are less than five years where the ossification centers have not fused, they do really well with the help of halo casts. I'm not talking about a halo vest, but halo casts. Where they are mobile, they are able to do everything. You can cut into a hole, into like a, a chest area, in the abdomen area, in the side areas. So, so they are ventilated. The the weight is also very light. The kids, the hygiene is also very good. And the halo casts are something that can really be managed quite well. We have did a couple of uh, similar cases and have presented also okay. where a halo cast not only helps you to stabilize that immobile segment but also preserves the C1 C2 rotation in long run as well. And believe me, in six weeks they fuse like fire. Okay. Thank you. We we'll move on to the next case. A 35-year-old patient with a normal neurology, uh, as you can see, is a type 2 wooden tired fractures. And uh, I, Dr. Sivas, do you do MRI in all these scenarios? <coughs> when the patient comes yes. to you, say, yes, with the history of trauma, uh, uh, one has to do it because there may be associated injury. And uh, transverse ligament injury is one of the important things which one should not miss. And okay. for that, one should do MRI. Any other uh, reason why you would like to get an MRI done? No. If suppose patient uh, has associated uh, injury in the lower cervical spine or there is some neurological deficit, in that situation, one should do it. And it is always better to have the full information. Okay. Uh, do you analyze, if you think that in this scenario where it's a comminuted fracture, you would like to go behind for a fixation, would you do an... Uh, arteriogram or MR angiogram in every patient with odontide fracture or any C1-C2 neglected odontide when you're doing a posterior C1-C2? No, usually if the x-ray or the clinical examination of the child or the person doesn't show any congenital anomaly, usually we don't, it is not a routine thing. Unless there is some feature clinically or radiologically where you have a doubt of congenital anomaly, one uh, need not do. Otherwise, if one is able to do it, it is better. It adds to 
the confidence that this patient doesn't have any vascular anomaly. Otherwise, in routine cases, we don't do it. Actually, in a fat separate image, the transverse ligament is uh, quite well seen. Yeah. And uh, we know that uh, in these type of injuries, the treatment of choice in any individual will be to do an odontoid fracture. And we also know that from multiple studies, when the fracture is displaced greater than four to six mm, a posterior displacement, whenever there is an angulation of the fracture of greater than 10 degrees, and when you are treating them conservatively, the fracture goes into malalignment, a delayed treatment, elderly patients and smoking are the known factors for non-union. And therefore, usually in these type of patients, we tend to indicate a surgical uh, management that is the odontide screws. Having said that, Suggest what would be your contraindications for odontoid screws in a patient with a type 2 odontoid fracture? Especially the fracture pattern, you have to see that uh, the angulation of the fracture and this landing fracture, you can, uh, if you do the odontoid screw, that uh, can uh, slip, uh, slip later and produce problems. The second is caminated fracture. Caminated fracture, sometimes you won't get, a, uh, get adequate fixation and even union uh, because the fragments cannot come and uh, sit, uh, sit properly. Third, uh, maybe the associated injury with, uh, of the Francis ligament. Okay. Uh, what about this, the patient uh, factors? What about? The patient Pardon? factors. Is there any patient factors that you take into consideration? Yeah, yeah. The chest, chest, uh, barrel chest, uh, something like that. If, uh, to get the angle properly, this situation also we have to uh, uh, to go for a posterior stabilization or a conservative management. Yeah, what about the duration of the injury? If you think the duration of injury has got a impact, like if somebody comes at uh, three weeks, four weeks, you would uh, still consider doing odontoid or you would like to do a posterior C1 C2? Uh, uh, three weeks, four weeks, I still uh, go for anterior fixation because uh, this uh, fracture usually unites. Uh, even though uh, unite, I do not produce my, uh, much of the problem. But after, after two months or so, better to go for posterior and get a, a posterior stabilization, even C2 fixation. That's my oh. protocol, actually. Yeah. All right, now this is what, as you mentioned, the fracture type, the associated uh, other injuries, comminuted fractures, transverse ligament injuries are the fracture patterns. Uh, this thing. Bharat, in this scenario, the what entire fracture in a patient with ankylosing spondylitis. I think you have got a paper in uh, Torcolumbar spine where you say you do a short segment. In these scenarios, whether you would like to treat them conservative or if surgical, what will you do? You will do an odontoid, C1, C2, or what else you will do? Uh, but, I, would, I would, yeah. I would prefer to do, if I can get the good access, then probably the only the anterior odontoid fixation would be enough. Um, probably looking at the, can I have the previous image? No, this is the image of this patient. Okay, okay. In that case, yeah, probably you know one can one can fix it with the with this with the odontoid. But then, yes, I think I should be able to fix it with your with your anterior screw. Okay. Uh, everybody agrees to that thing, or uh, in odontoid fractures? Can I ask one question? No, I, I don't think fracture of C1 arch. C1 arch as well. There is C1 arch fracture. Yes. No, if there is a C1 no arch fracture, is not there. The type two odontoid in ankylosed spine. Would you prefer to go from the front? Uh, you know, Adish, I normally, if I'm Gautam Zaveri, I normally in this type of ankylosing spondylitis, the anterior bone quality is so poor that the screw does not have a hold or a purchase. And this, therefore, anterior alone screw is not a great idea. However, in this case, the quality uh, looks okay. Quality seems to be fairly decent. Yeah, fairly good. And one may be able to get away with an anterior odontoid screw. The second yeah. point question is the liver arm. In ankylosing spondylitis, because of the fusion, there are long liver arms and therefore all the stress gets concentrated at the level of the fracture site. And uh, But in an odont, here you are talking about an odontoid fracture where there is no motion between segments. So if you can pass an odontoid screw and then immobilize the patient for a sufficient length of time, it may be enough. It may not be the ideal treatment. I would probably uh, kind of veer towards a posterior long segment fixation uh, as opposed to Bharat. But um, Ajay, but yeah, I have two points to say. Possible. Yes, so The other thing is in 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 high, in Engspons, the fractures are extension injuries. 
even this fracture looks to be an extension injury. Yes. And we all must remember that hyperextension injuries are a contraindication for doing your odontoid screw because they get reduced only by flexion where you cannot do an odontoid screw well. And even in this patient where the hyperextension injury is there, even if you can do, I would still refrain from doing an odontoid screw because the liver arm, like Dr. Gotham pointed out, is going to be an extension which will just lead to uh, uh, loosening of the screw very, very soon, if not sooner than later. This, this patient also yeah. appears to have OPLL. Yes. So probably, probably considering that OPLL, if we have the MRI, I think probably we'll find some lower cervical cord compression as well at the C2 to C6, which probably may need intervention as well. So probably, you know, one may consider after the MRI, the choice of the treatment. The so biggest want to problem say something? There, Bharat, will be that the patient is an ankylos patient. He has a kyphotic spine. Yeah. And therefore, what happens is that his and upper chest becomes almost barrel shaped and protrudes upwards. So to get the proper angulation to point for putting anterior odontoid screw is almost impossible. And therefore, a uh, anterior uh, odontoid screw becomes technically very difficult. Satish, yeah, I, yeah. I think more than looking at the x-rays, you have to look at the patient habitus, whether the patient can be positioned properly for the odontoid screw. Third, whether, you know, when you do the odontoid screw, the space between yeah. C2 and C3, whether it's really reachable to you, because some of the times, a lot of anterior osteophyte ALL is calcified in this patient. And you, at the same time, remember, patient has to, at least, whatever the fastness in you, you do, one hour, sometime, patient has to be in extended position of the neck. With associated canal stenosis at the lower level, be careful to attempt the anterior and ankylosing spondylosis. And as mentioned by Gautam, or Bharat, that look at always the MRI picture, fracture position, patient habitus, and the position which you undertake. Without that, the post you know, fusion is much better in these patients than anterior alone. And what we did was basically an occipital cervical fusion. Yeah, MRI didn't, I don't have the pictures with me right now, but anyway, it went on to have a, uh, no major issues. Basically, we thought since it's ankle spine, if you try to do a posterior C1, C2, I mean, the hole could be very poor, osteoporotic. And uh, prior to the injury, it didn't have much of neck rotation. Therefore, our concern was not the neck rotation. Therefore, we uh, tended to go uh, lower down. I think laminectomy has been done in this case. You can see up to probably you know, the lower lamina, three, four are missing. One, I can't. <laughs> three, L, C3, C4 are missing. So maybe. Okay, carry on, please. Therefore, the other contraindications for doing an anterior odontoid yeah, is the, uh, is the yeah. ossified ligaments. Yeah. Okay. But uh, Satish, be ready. I think uh, in the next 10 minutes, we'll be ready. What about the reduction uh, manuals while positioning? Vijay, what do you think about the reduction manuals? Like, you, know, you have a displaced fracture, anterior or posterior displaced fractures. Yes. And how do you reduce it? Okay. Um, Ideally, I kind of normally prefer to do it under GA, under uh, CR uh, monitoring and with uh, SSCP monitoring. It is fairly safe to uh, reduce these fractures because, as you said right at the beginning, the rule of thirds, there is normally a generous uh, subarachnoid space. Um, and I normally have the head positioned in a, a Mayfield head holder. Um, that way, you know, you can use the head holder itself to do the manipulation. Basically by a bit of traction. Yes, a little bit of traction and then a little bit of, uh, usually a little bit of flexion uh, is what is normally needed, but depends on how the displacement okay. is uh, located. But okay. normally a little bit of traction uh, will get it into a good position and then you can use the Mayfield itself as the fixator, you know, so you don't have to go into an additional traction or, or weights or anything like that. The Mayfield itself can be used to, to maintain the traction um, and okay. positioning. Yeah. What will you um, do? I mean, if there is a situation like this intraoperatively, you put the guide wire, it looks good. As you start uh, trying to ream it, you find that it is displaced. Yes. Yeah. What will you do then? Um, okay. One of the two things that you can do often is that just by uh, a little bit of manual pushing with the uh, retractor itself, you can often uh, reduce that. So, you know, in um, above your drill, so you have the little sleeve of uh, your cervical retractor. So you can just use that to actually gently push 
uh, forward or backward, either on C2 or on C1, depending on how you want the thing to be positioned. Yeah. Often yeah. just by withdrawing a little bit, you will find that it is the pressure that you are putting with the retractor and with the drill itself, which is causing the, the mild reduction. Yeah. And just by sort of easing off on the pressure a little bit, often it will come back to uh, normal again. But just make sure that you know no, no push is happening on, on either of the fragments as you're drilling in. One of the techniques what we do practice is our anesthetist uh, will take yeah. an step to the gauze. As you can see in the picture, it's pushed yeah. and then even posteriorly. Transorally. Yeah, transorally. Transorally. Any other su uh, suggestions? I mean, uh, okay. Can, if, I, will, any, I, I will show you. Yeah, yeah. So you can just bring the head part slightly down, and that also tries to uh, you know uh, maintain this. It comes down because it has moved forward. So little bit of the movement of that can also help in that. Apart from pushing from the oral side, that can also help sometimes. Yeah, but for us, uh, that moving the head is a little difficult because I have it normally positioned in a Mayfield and then that kind of makes, you know, movement of the head quite a fiddly affair because you have to loosen the Mayfield and then the whole thing. Yeah. What, what do you think are the important steps when you have to do anterior odontoid fixation? I mean, uh, the patient-wise is fine, but important steps during the procedure? You are asking um, me? Before... very. Before Welcome. going to the screw fixation, I would like to, in our center, we normally put the traction while patient is awake and we take the x-ray uh, while the patient is awake and we see how much reduction we have achieved. So we are ready for the for operative maneuver as well. So that's what normally we practice. In the morning only, we bring the patient in in the OT and then we give the traction and then we take the lateral x-ray after a few hours maybe two, three hours, and we see the reduction. That's what normally we practice in our center. Right. Gautam, what are, yeah. Gautam, what do you think are the critical steps in anterior odontoid screw fixation? I think the first and most critical step is the positioning of the patient, followed by second step being positioning of the CM machines. If you can get two CM machines perpendicular to each other, then you have saved yourself a lot of grief. Otherwise, every time you move the CM machine, the type of image you will see will be slightly different and therefore your point of entry of the screw will be different. The third point is to before even making your skin incision, you must put a K wire next to it, the projected trajectory of your screw so that you can make a skin incision. Though you are putting a screw into C2, the skin incision is somewhere at C5-6. Yeah. The if you have radiolucent retractors, even better. If not, it still works very well. You expose all the way up to the base of C2. What I like to do is drill the anterior surface of C3 vertebral body, the anterior superior surface a little bit, because then it gives me an access into the C2, C2, through the C2-3 disc. I push the disc a little bit below, behind and put it in. The fourth thing is, once you've got decided your entry, you must remember that a small movement by you changing your direction by about two degrees with your hand means that the angulation of your wire will change by about 20, 25 degrees. So even small movements are critical. Now, once you've done that, the next thing is to use a drill and start off your entry. If you start with a K wire, the K wire being flexible becomes very difficult to introduce to the hard cortical bone of the C2 end plate. So you go first with the drill, drill a little bit, two, three, four millimeters into the body, and then you pass the K wire through that. And when you pass the K wire, you aim for the posterior tip of the odontoid. And make sure that you are going in the midline as much as possible, straight down, up and down. Okay, I think I, as you mentioned, probably the imaging, the entry points are probably and the trajectory are the three important factors and other things are important. I think Satish is going to discuss. Yeah, so I'm going to stop your screen now. And no, no, I no, will... one second, one second. Sorry. <laughs> Just one minute. Okay, go ahead. Please share it again. Then. Yeah, and this is the example of it before Satish comes to... It's not moving. Yeah. 
what will you do when intraoperatively you find your you are already started your trajectory is wrong and you find that the guide wire is going to the posterior cortex suggest what will you do in this scenario i mean uh, you already tapped it a bit but you find that everything is going wrong what will you do in this scenario you have to withdraw everything we have to start with a new uh, uh, entry point probably you can go as a little sideways or a, uh, move a slightly from the midline if you go through the same trajectory uh, and try to adjust the kv is never go to go uh, in the same uh, it will always go to the same the old uh, path so i think you have to find a new uh, tra uh, trajectory uh, uh, trajectory new entry point for a new trajectory because uh, in past we were doing two screws into the odontoid that was also okay. possible so there is enough space for you to maneuver a little bit this way and uh, this side or uh, left side or right side to get a new trajectory for the okay satish now satish is going yeah. to demonstrate a wooden tail screws and let us know how not to do it how to do it right and to avoid the pitfalls what we have discussed so far satish you can see this screen. satish can you share your screen i will right so all of for all those of you who don't know dr satish a neurosurgeon is one of the masters of anterior odontoid screw he is going to tell you every step from how to position how to get a good cap image intraop how to reduce it intraop if it is not completely reduced and the various steps in the technique please go ahead satish yeah, thank you gautam thank you uh, ajay for introducing the whole thing in a good way and uh, i'm uh, hope that all the doctors are remaining safe and uh, taking care of themselves against this covid and remain healthy so i will talk about the only the you know because ajay has spoken in detail about the indication contraindication what to be done and everything it is easy for me i will show you example and then go into the video directly so as mentioned by ajay this is one of the younger patients with classical type 2 odontoid fracture where the fracture fragment has displaced posteriorly and in fact in this patient why we should do an mri is patient had a transient weakness in all four limbs which improved which in classically you can see there is a edema within the cord and also there is a hematoma collection behind the body of the c2 which suggests that it's not a simple injury it is a high speed accident and whenever these things happen unless you know you do the mri and look at the transverse ligament never proceed to your odontoid screw fixation so considering the anterior osteosynthesis uh, from all practical purpose if uh, if the fracture happens to me or to you what we want in the present day is a preserved neck movement so the preservation of the neck movement is have you know in odontoid fracture happens only when you use anterior c2 and odontoid screw fixation rather than anything else so as far as possible unless patient is severely osteoporotic unless patient is too old in every patient whether it's a young patient of two and a half year old child to the eldest patient try first whether it is feasible to do anterior screw fixation for that that's the reason this webinar is the first webinar we are starting and in this patients as mentioned by ajay all this procedure is done by doing a incision very low at c56 level so that we'll get a trajectory which is parallel to the sternum up to the c2 level so to go to that trajectory you have to go enter from far away remember whenever you hold the any of the instrument far away from the site of your you know surgery your movements as mentioned by the gautam where you move the hand the tip will have a wider arc so whenever you do with a wider arc your mistakes is higher so make sure that you are very stable and make sure that your hand is well supported on the chest of the patient whenever you're using any of the instrument in order to tighten screw so that you not miss the midline in a single screw fixation or in the lateral groove in the two screw fixation and it is a standard c1 c2 and uh, so standard uh, c56 exposure in these patients which i need not go into the detail so what are the points you should consider the point you should consider you know to those students and the fellows who are listening to this thing is you had to plan everything for this surgery on the pre previous day of, of the surgery so look at the fracture geometry look at your patient habitus whether the patient is severely obese whether the patient is a barrel chest and most often female if there's a large breast 
which is coming in the way of your uh, trajectory of your instrument, it is very difficult. Sometimes you have to put, pull the plaster away and put the plasters to keep the midline intact for you. And also, you have to plan whether you are, have, your OT has a radiolucent table and whether you have proper uh, anesthetic technique, uh, especially in a patient like what I've shown, where there is a neurological injury preoperatively to this patient which recovered, you had to have anesthetic team who can do an awake intubation to me. And all the intubations in this transoral we will be doing through the transoral approach, not nasopharyngeal approach. And as far as possible, do awake intubation. And these patients who had an injury, you know, should be on MBP continuous in addition to SSCP. And oral intubation to be done and make sure the tube is pushed to the side so that your, the ETT -ET tube, which has the wires, especially flexible, flexometallic tube when you're using, the wires will come in your view. So you have to make sure it is positioned far lateral. So never take an anesthetist who has not done this procedure you use your routine anesthetist who has done always with you, so he will understand very well. And you had to have a clear open mouth x-ray. So what I use is a champagne cork. You can clearly see in this picture, a champagne cork is kept in the mouth, which widely opens, wider at the top, narrow at the bottom. It keeps complete mouth open and every x-ray passes through this. So you will not have any problem. And your C arm positioning also becomes very easy whenever you use this cork uh, into that. So, and keep it vertically, not horizontally, so that the wide opening will happen. So just because of using the cork, don't drink on the previous day so that your hand will not move in a proper way otherwise. So you, as mentioned by the, my previous speakers, like Vijay Kumar, they, I use GW traction with a weight to stabilize the head rather than the Mayfield or the uh, Sugita frame because once you use the Sukita frame and maybe sometimes x-rays come in the view and sometimes x-rays become very difficult and manipulation also become difficult during the surgery. And also sometimes you'd use the proper bolsters to keep slight extension of the neck when you required, especially in a fracture fragment, which is slipped anteriorly to push it posterior, you might need an extension. So you have to need a bolster either at the interscapular region or below the neck. So you have to have the proper bolster and make sure that in you know, a whole team understand, especially if you're working with a fellow and a new fellow or a junior consultant, make sure that they will learn this technique properly on the previous day so that they will keep all these things ready for you on, you know, during surgery. So the OR setup, you know, is always preferable and should be done according to me with the two C arms. So be good with your another orthopedic uh, surgeon or ENT surgeon who are using the C arm. You can borrow with them on that day. And a true transoral view is mandatory to have it. What is true transoral uh, view? When you, whenever you do the AP view, both the lateral C1, C2 joint should be seen. And usually the fracture fragment will be extending along the line of the, uh, uh, the joint. So any joint which is a true type 2 odontoid fracture will have the fracture along the joint, unlike in a syndesmosis fracture, which can happen above that level. So, you know, luckily I have a biplanar pleuroscopy unit of a spine unit. Uh, so we do by bi biplane images, which reduce the radiation, not only to you and to the whole team, which is, you know, useful. And if you're in a good hospital, you can ask the cat lab team, if your cardiologist is good, they can also give you biplanar images so that you can do the surgery very easily. And your technician has to be proper on that day because sometimes you had to AP view, you need a craniocaudal angulation of this C arm. And they had to mark it and fix this C arm in the same position so that they will not move it again throughout the procedure. So if they move, they repeatedly are getting radiation increases in this position and your trajectory becomes difficult. So look, at, this is the video standard C56 exposure. You can see cranial onto the left side and the caudal onto the right side. Patient is horizontal position. I'm a right-handed surgeon standing onto the right side. Now I'm dissecting the subcutaneous fat in this patient along with the, uh, the platysma muscle. So I suggest always, you know, I tell everybody, use the microscope from the beginning as far as possible so that you will have a clean field. Important is a clean field. You can do microscopically, but when you use the clean field, the amount of dissection you are creating because 
from C5, 6 to C2 level you're ending. So many of the patients, elderly patients, if you have a fracture, you know, unnecessary bad dissection, bleeding, movement and retraction in this age can create a significant deglutition problem to these patients. You have done a beautiful surgery, but it ends up in the deglutition problem. Patient may not, you know, like it. So go through normal standard avascular plane of loose areal or tissue between carotid fascia and the tracheoesophageal group. So every level, make sure you are totally, you know, bloodless. And identify C56 level. You need, to, you know, once you identify the pre vertebral fascia, just coagulate, go below that, and then enter into the next plane. So dissect, most important, the plas platysma dissection. The platysma has to be lifted up with both the hands, dissect up to C3 level, then you will identify clearly the C23 junction. You see here in this picture, what we are seeing is this is the midline, this is a C3 and C2. Many of the times, the wadentoid you will never see. What you see is the hump of the C3. Once you see the hump of the C3, because it is so narrow, you make doubly sure by keeping a, you know, all, take an X-ray and double confirm where you are at the C23 disc space level. So what is important is notice whether there is a C23 osteophytes, reaffirm your midline with X-ray and identify C2 inferior leg. So as seen, shown by Ajay in the previous case of ankylosing spondylosis, you know, sometimes you'll find the osteophytes extending from C56 up to C23 level in these patients. And especially identifying C23 level is cumbersome and very, very difficult in the patients with ankylosing spondylosis. And you might have to drill. As you drill, even the disc space will be calcified in such patients. Be careful in such patients and remain always in the midline. So you can clearly see in this patient, craniocaudally, we are seeing, take a all first, make a pilot hole. So once you make the pilot hole, so you make the pilot hole exactly the midline. If this is the esophagus, don't lift it too much. Once you keep the translucent retractor hole under the microscope, the beauty of the microscope is you will be seeing this so easily. Your assistant will not be pulling the esophagus or the trachea unnecessarily, which creates the problem here. So there are two methods of making the pilot hole. The first method is a classical method where you use the guide wire with automated drill. So in this, so you had to be perfectly sure which is the midline and which direction anterior posteriorly you're ending. So once you go through first two centimeter, every time you want to change, you know, it is very difficult. So entry once made cannot be changed with the K-wire and chance of K-wire bending you because you'll be bending at the your wrist level, which is far away from your point of entry. Your bending of the K-wire is significant. And when you put a drill over a K-wire, which is bent, sometimes it cuts through that. Be careful, you know, extremely careful. Once the wire cuts, you cannot take it out. And direction once made, you know, by the K-wire, the towards the distal fragment cannot be changed if you use the K-wire unless you make another pilot hole as suggested by suggestion manner. So the second method, which, you know, they see this is the first method, we use the K-wire entering into the what entire fracture segment through automated drill. The second method is using the, the I use first the pilot hole with the all, then I use the two M and drill. So into that enter because you can manipulate whichever the side you want. The ultimately what we want is the trajectory should be towards the posterior end of the fra distal fragment of the wooden part. And at the same time, you should have good amount of cancerous bone between the anterior surface of the C2 and your drill bit. And when you use this drill bit, you know, it is very easy to manipulate and you can manipulate from a distance. It will give you better hold to you than a caver alone. So this is a very good method to make sure that sometime you can reduce also C2 with this. And you enter only up to the level of the proximal fragment. You will never enter with that to the distal. Otherwise, it requires a lot of force. Then remove that and then reintroduce your K wire. Reintroduce your K wire and drill it into your distal fragment. It is almost like a first one, but your manipulation becomes easy and it's much more useful, especially if the fracture fragment is not aligned with you. Sometimes you can do it manipulation using the hand drill technique in the proximal segment. 
So, and the continuation of the same thing, you know, use, even after using the drill, the second step going into the distal fragment is, should be done always with automated drill, pneumatic drills. And whenever you are crossing through the fragment, there will be some resistance. So be careful. Don't try to push it harder. And make sure the screen of the C arm, you'll be watching rather than the operative field. So literally speaking, unlike any other surgery, it is like an endoscopic surgery. You're watching the C arm picture and you're drilling here, which gives a different perspective. If you are not used to it, and if you are doing for the few, you know, without, without experience, sometime it will just plunge through the distal fragment and it can direct if you put too much of force into that. The force happens at two points. One, when you're entering from the proximal fragment to the distal segment, that means crossing the fracture segment. Second one, when you reach the topmost part of the wooden toy, that is, is the cortical part of the, you know, the tip of the wooden toy. So once you reach the tip of the wooden toy, in case if you want to have a good reduction of the gap, for example, if the gap of the fracture fragment is more than, you know, uh, 4 mm or 5 mm, sometimes you have to reapproximate with the lax screw. So at that time, the K wire, if it just penetrates the superior part of the wooden toy, then, man, you know, the first thread of the screw goes through that, the compression effect will be much better. But when you do with the K wire, extremely careful. So distal one, do not do in the beginning, just make a small bit so opening into that and withdraw because otherwise when you're drilling, K wire just passes through that into the nasopharynx and sometimes into the carrot, you know, into the foramen magnum region without your knowledge when you're using the drill, not the K wire section. So next one, use the 3.2 mm drill bit. And once again, you realign with the C arm. After entering the first one centimeter, take it twice a C arm because at least, you know, on an average, I take about 16 to 17 shoots per wooden tight screw. So even though with the experience, we take about 16 to 17, sometime in the beginning, it might require much higher. Don't be scared, protect yourself with the radio, you know, uh, all the lead aprons and thyroids and everything, and make sure your assistants will also have and nurses will have it so that your trajectory becomes perfect. First time is the best time trajectory. So never do multiple time because it is in the narrow field which you are working, you will become very fatigued. And if you don't have a good trajectory, you'll be very upset and create problem to everybody, including yourself. So the drill, when you are passing through, like anywhere else, like a transarticular screw or a wooden tight screw, the bone chip sits between the drill and the KY. So initially, when you are passing through the KY, it goes very well. But once it goes to the distal one, the K wire and the drill becomes a single unit. And sometimes it passes beyond the level, the K wire passes beyond the level of distal end. And it might enter the, you know, uh, the foramen magnum. Be watchful of it. When it happens, immediately you have to withdraw behind. And that uh, you know, single segment, you can avoid it when you wash it properly. You, you put the saline into the operative field when you're drilling through. Some of the bone fragment will come out and the drill remains free over the K1. So this is the you know video which is showing on to the right side where I'm drilling, which is passing through to the distal segment of the K wire. So the tip of the guide wire is left untapped as far as possible because you can go afterwards with the hand drill again. So remove the tap, remove the hand drill, then insert the measure this length of the screw because the K wires will have the marking. Any standard company will come now with the length of the K wire, which is a black mark mark in the proximal segment below behind the sheath you will have the black mark and which will show the length of the screw. And on average, it takes about 36 to 40 millimeter in the Indian population. But in you children... Start winding up, please. Yeah. In, in children, it might be slightly, you know, shorter. We have to have a different, you know, method in that. So then push the, uh, the uh, screw over the wire and it will compress the fragment. And at the end, you know, in the, under the microscope, you can see this and take it out. And with the hand drill, you can push it further. So the tips and tricks is good platysma dissection. Entry made with the all at the C2 entry inferior cardinal. Hand drill is used in the proximal segment for the better control. Guide wire is passed manually into the pilot hole of the proximal fragment and automated for the distal fragment. Tapping in knot done at the tip, which you can do with the hand itself. So this is 
the post-operative picture of the patients. So you can, you know, you can see this patient is a complete movement of this. The point to be considered, fracture geometry, and whether TL injury, associated AD, don't do the one touch screw fixation at that point. Osteoporosis, be careful. And if there is stable C1 fracture, be careful. If there is displacement, look for the reducibility. And you can see here is this patient transferally with the uh, artery force if we have pushed it. In some patients, we have done transoral opening and reduced it. And when applicable, when the C armor is used, or the, you know, you have the uh, cath lab, you can do a three-dimensional picture of these things and double confirm whole thing, which is you know, in the good position. Thank you Thank very you, much. Thank you, Dr. Satish. Can you stop your sharing your screen, please? Ajoy, yes. can you please come up again on the screen? Yes, sir. So that was a wonderful exposition. I think the salient features are in the positioning. Generally, in an odontoid fracture, which is non-displaced, gentle or even minimally displaced, just gentle traction with two to three kgs with the neck kept straight is enough. If it is anteriorly displaced, a small bolster to the shoulders to give a slight extension along with traction reduces it. And Otherwise, if it is uh, posteriorly displaced, then you have to put three, three, four bed sheets below the head to give slight flexion along with the traction. In a majority of these patients, it reduces with that. And if it, and you must try to reduce the fracture before you start the surgery. Else, the cork method which Satish showed is very useful if it is well reduced. If it is not reduced, then what? I have seen the Ganga hospital that is Dr. Ajoy Shetty doing is putting gauze pieces into the mouth and then pressing on it using a tamp or a sponge on holder to reduce the dislocation, the forward subluxation during the surgery. So even that works. Positioning of the CM is absolutely critical, getting a good transoral view as well as a good lateral view. Then you go on to the procedure dissection has to be done Incision is at C5-6. You dissect all the way up to C2-3. Start by high, with a high-speed drill. Drill the anterior superior surface of C3 body so that you can enter the CT, C2 end plate in the proper trajectory just inside the C2-3 disc area. Start with a drill bit because it will give you a better way to control your initial fall position. And then once you are inside by four or five millimeters, put in a K wire and direct it all the way to the posterior superior corner. Anyway, without much ado, we'll go back to Dr. Satish, I mean to Ajay, and we'll go from there. Uh, while we are waiting for Ajay, uh, Satish, there is a question from the audience for you. Mm -hmm. Dr. Vishal just mentioned sometime mm -hmm. back that an extension fracture is a contraindication to putting in an anterior odontoid screw. So is that necessarily true? Because normally a lot of fractures are extension fractures and yeah. we do do anterior odontoid screw fixation in that. Correct. You know, from my perspective, these are relative contraindication, not the absolute contraindication. The, it is a you know, real contraindication in two fracts, you know, uh, when you have another fragment, when the fracture fragment is uh, extended along with the C1 arch gone and the transverse ligament is gone and the patient had an Atlantic dislocation in preoperative x-ray. At that time, don't do it. Go posterior with it, you know, posteriorly located fragment. Satish, Otherwise, any, there was the first case shown was a small child. There is yeah. a question from the audience. Is there a role for putting the patient in a cast, a Minerva cast? See, uh, my my experience with the Minerva cast is very less, but I, you know, the first patient which is shown by Ajay is not the classical type two odontoid fracture. It is a fracture through the body, and fracture through the body is almost like a type three fractures. And these patients with halo brace, as mentioned by I think Vishal, if do wonderfully for the children, and they play very well with that because we had to preserve the the movement to that. If in case if you want to do the surgery, you can use the Herbert screw in these patients because you don't have uh, other screws available for these kind of patients. Right. Dr. Bharat Dave, you had a co co comment to make yeah. before I pass the yeah. mic to Ajoy again. In, in, that, in the case which was shown on 
the first case two year patient i yes. think one when you put the posterior wires one should be very careful if you tighten it yeah. in the, from the midline they will give way because this is epiphyseal and the weakest part of the bone and we have had one case where it gave way after two weeks of the surgery on table it looked pretty okay and then we had put some bone chips as well but then it gave way so one has to be very careful when you tighten the wire if it is in the midline it is likely to give way and also when you tighten the wire there is a risk in the world that the fracture of the odontoid peg may actually displace posterior, posterior. Yeah. tightening so yeah. you have to be careful and that is why when tightening the brook jenkins method was established where you put a graft between the c1 c2 arch to prevent limit the amount of tightening you would do anyway yeah. thank it you is... very much let's move back to ajay ajay please continue yeah. uh, if you have got a wrong trajectory i mean uh, we can try to change the direction of the trajectory but the other option what has been discussed in the literature is to at the same time you have got already got a problem people have tried using anterior c1 c2 transarticular screws you just change the direction to the lateral side and anteriorly fix it this is from that article per se not my experience wherein they have shown that the wooden tire tends to heal even though one more example even though there is a loosening but you can still slowly the anterior uh, c1 c2 joint is tend to be uh, i mean gradually then uh, fusing by itself as per the literature there are two ways to start the anterior c1 c2 one is just lateral to the entry of from the midline between the c2 three the other one is at the base of the c1 c2 joint okay the most important thing you have to remember is the fact that the vertebral artery is on the lateral side over here therefore your lateral dissection uh, direction should be relatively lesser uh satish are anybody has got a experience with this yeah uh, see anterior one what is important is uh, first you have to see the groove on the on c3 on c2 uh, in the midline there is a hump on the side there is a groove available with satish we are not okay. hearing you yeah can you hear me yeah yeah can you hear me yes yeah so the groove on the lateral side of the c2 from the midline is the point of entry which is about 3 mm to take and angulate laterally in an angle of 35 to 40 degree and pass through the joint it is a easy procedure but only thing is the side of you know opposite to you that is on the left side is much more easier same side when you are doing your retraction becomes much more difficult but it is not a bad this thing but in an adult to retract to the highest level sometimes they will have significant deglutition problem that is the only reason i don't do it okay i will move forward uh, this is a 27 year old patient trauma normal neurology presented at 3 weeks duration uh, this is a ct scan vijay what do you think you will do for this patient is about 3 weeks old 27 year old normal neurology there is a bit of combination even at the base Yeah, there is. Yeah, and uh, yeah, but the fracture, uh, uh, the angulation is favorable for a for a nodentoid screw, but it is comminuted, and the distal fragment is actually quite small. So my concern here is whether we would get enough purchase um, with the uh, lag screw to actually uh, hold this in place. Okay, um, you're considering posterior. What would be your approach usually? See, posterior nowadays I almost always do the Goelham's technique in, uh, because I find that kind of lot more predictable and reliable compared to a transarticular uh, fixation. I think we will hear about both techniques, but uh, my practice certainly has changed from doing transarticular C1 C2 screws um, almost completely. now to doing uh, c1 c2 uh, lateral mass uh, and pedicle screw we go and have shall we shall uh, yes. what will you do if you are considering posterior forget about the anterior part you think a wooden tight screw is not feasible if you are considering posterior would you like to do a transarticular or a uh, so like this this is a this is a ideal arm. case i uh, my, my my philosophy this is the ideal case for doing a transarticular screw fixation not only because i am um, uh, i mean i am biased towards it but also because it is the new gold standard i would say that 
the problems like dr vijay kumar just mentioned the problems of transarticular screw are not associated with the technique per se i would say they are usually associated with the pre op planning not that uh, all of us don't do it but uh, uh, if there is one thing that can change the whole course of problems associated with transarticular screw it is pre operative planning and if you if you are really uh, get used to we are going to listen to you with the, yeah. about that Yes. I think transarticular. This is the juice case for transarticular through thirty minutes straight for a while. What we did was posterior C one C two, but you see at the period of seven months, the CT scan shows the orientoid is healed, and then we removed the implant, and this is the range of motion what he has after the removal of the implant. Uh, Sajesh, what do you think of this technique of temporary stabilization from posterior and remove the implant once the fracture heals? At what time? At uh, what point of time you remove the implant? One, one year. But you should remove it about uh, seven to nine months. It depends on when the patient is uh, willing to come at that time. We have to so, document in the CT scan. The, okay, I never did the uh, removal yet because that's a good idea that if the movements can be re reinstated, this is a very good idea to uh, to do it. And but uh, the joint will be healthy even after uh, one year. Even see the joint will be healthy even after one year. We have to wait and see. I've done in few cases, but I'll go through the literature. In normal. Yeah. So I have a question. Say the guess. What if it doesn't unite? You have not put bone graft, and say if it doesn't unite, then what? The basic requirement is you to be you have to be sure intraoperatively that you have achieved the reduction. Okay. what we do why is why can't it, you do halo but you can't like uh, compress the fragment you know it is still uh, the fragment is not compressed it's just aligned align the fracture and then you there is no significant gap usually it tends to heal we have done that only in right. about four to five patients i would i would agree with ajoy in the sense that uh, i have now done a few not for odontoid fractures but certainly for uh, very displaced uh, uh, c1 fractures you know so uh, um, where you have a jefferson type and then we have done like a temporary occiput cervical fixation and then removed it at a year once uh, it is healed up so the joint mobility point which uh, sajesh raised uh, that we find that in the occipital cervical complex somehow the joint is uh, able to maintain a reasonable amount of uh, mobility and flexibility even after fixation for a year or so you know that's been i will i will show the literature as such yeah. in normal individual the c1 c2 joint is responsible for as much as 60% of the total rotation and in c1 c2 is 35 to 41 degrees of rotation that tends to happen when you use an anterior odontoid screw is not without a loss of motion people have documented at least 15 degrees usually but in elders probably because of degenerative changes it could be as high as 45% and as mentioned the c1 c2 will lead to about 60% loss of neck rotation this is a paper i mean there are quite a significant number of papers in the last few years and majority of them are coming from china where then they have looked at posterior reduction and temporary fixation for odontoid fractures and they have noticed that the range of motion of c1 c2 after removal this is immediately after a period of 3 to 6 months of removal the rotation was available from about 25 degrees plus or minus 5 degrees and they didn't observe any they had taken ct scan they didn't observe any particular arthritic changes this is one more paper which has compared between a odontoid screw and a, a posterior temporary c1 c2 it is not a randomized study they have, they have taken 20 patients in this group and 20 patients in that group 19 of them healed in both groups no different in the outcome in the posterior temporary fixation group the range of motion was about 32 degrees whereas the anterior fixation group the range of motion was 40 degrees therefore at least i could find out about 8 to 10 literatures which have compared these techniques and as such it seems to be a quite a reasonable technique provided you are able to achieve a good reduction so that it ends to fuse and then you can remove the implant ashitik mentioned if it goes to non union then you are in a big big problem I'll come to the I think, I think Ajay, Ajay, we also need to put in a disclaimer here that one of a kind, uh, that one they are only useful in patients with type two odontoid fractures. However, the surgical damage to the C one C two capsule, it has been noted in patients where C one C two where even you have not put in graft, 
C1, C2 joints tend to go into fibrous union and very often, even without putting a graft, they would just unite it across. So okay. while removing the implant, we should really be sure that we are dealing with the right kind of patient who has been told about it and we have not created that intraoperative iatrogenic capsular injury and we are sure that we are not going to be dealing with a post-operative rota painful rotation just for the sake of having rotation. I, I, I agree to that. But in our practice, what we do is... That, that would happen if you do a transarticular screw and remove it. Transarticular, you remove or you don't remove it, it's going to fuse. Don't the remove it, yeah. yeah so, to, because it's transarticular, it's going to go through the joint, so... Yeah, but Maybe here this also, one is better if you don't go through the joint. You cannot put a yeah. screw yeah. without disturbing the capsule there. You can. I'll you show can, you. But it's, yeah, I understand. I, I mean, this is the point to be taken. We'll move to the next case. The 22-year-old lady diagnosed with a wooden tire fracture, operated elsewhere, came to us six months later with persistent neck pain. They had already, unfortunately, they submitted the primary X-rays for insurance. It was not available. It is a six-month radiograph, and uh, she has got significant neck pain. And this is the CT scan which shows a non-union. The screw tip is almost protruding out slightly. The MRI doesn't show anything significant. I've not put it. Before, the question is, uh, it's here, MRI is films. Question is, is it necessary to remove the screw, number one? Shitik, I mean, is it necessary to remove the screw? And no. Uh, no, no. what are you going to do? It's not necessary to remove the screw. Sorry, I saw it. But yeah. I had the answer before that. So yeah. It's not necessary to remove the screw unless the screw is sticking out. This screw is inside and you know it's going to give a trouble if it is going to move. So if you're going to fuse this from behind, the screw is going to stay there forever. Okay. So I will not remove the screw. I mean, yeah. basically, Fine. as you said, I mean, in most of these orientated non-unions are even a non-union following anterior fixation. If there is a fibrous movement, literature says you do a posterior fusion, it fuses well. You don't need to do anything much from the anterior side, unless it is Achai. protruding far inside, or unless it's causing a problem. Ajay, in your case, yeah. the, this has happened purely because the head is not sunk into C2 body. The head was on C3, C23 disc space, and this is the one of the wrong things everybody will do: not measuring the correct length of the screw. So measuring the correct length of the screw and sinking the head into the body is the key to prevent this kind of a problem where the anterior cortex rips off because it C1, C2 acts as a single segment. The next motion which happens is C3, 4, uh, C2, 3 and the head comes and hits the C3 every time and it rips off. In addition to fibrous Also, monument. the entry point is more on the anterior cortex Correct. rather than Correct. between just below the... Uh, the but here, here the... in this, here in this case, you can't judge because this is an X-ray after yeah. six months. Yes, we wouldn't know that. how he they had put it at that time. Means they could have put it like correctly and still had such a problem. So it's difficult okay. to judge at a six months. Uh, I agree. I agree to that. See, uh, therefore, in the back out heel screw, usually we don't do anything much. But we have situations when you find that it is failed, but the patient is asymptomatic. He doesn't want, as is one of our patients, he doesn't want to do anything. You have a situation like we have done a posterior C1, C2 fusion. It's not a temporary fixation one. But you can see there is a non-union. But patient is asymptomatic. Even if you're advising surgery, is not willing to undergo anything. What will he do? You will revise in this scenario. If revising, what will be the approach? Vijay, Bharat, Bharat. Yeah. I think I think I would I would uh, certainly have the MRI shows nothing, no compression, no no symptom, and, and He's asymptomatic, and, and no no low grade infection. We should consider that as well. Okay, the, I think that is what I would say, and probably you know because on one side, on the right side of the third CT scan image, it seems that this uh, the occiput C1 joint, yeah, that looks pretty damaged as well. So probably if really I want to give one answer then probably maybe extension of the fusion from oxywood C2, C3. Is, I feel that it's quite asymptomatic. You said it is asymptomatic. Yes. yes. Sorry. Sorry, I missed that. If it is asymptomatic, probably one can give... An, what's the age of the patient? He's young, about 30 years. Yeah. In that case, probably, you know, give teriparatide. I would give that and then, you know, wait for a few months and I'm sure it will heal with the teriparatide. For you. Okay. okay. 
Why fought uh, you, sir? Dr. Bharat, sir, why fought you? I mean, he's a young guy. Why, why should we uh, extend our indications for using this therapy? Agree, agree. But then, uh, as I said, you know, asymptomatic patient and probably you would... Don't do anything. Don't do anything. Just observe. Even observing. But then look at look at the C1, oxybut and C1. Yeah, yeah, that think, screw is I just touching there. If, if he's, that he's going was destroyed, he could have easily been in pain. I think he's, 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 he's going to come back. Let him come back, sir. It's okay. I think it oh, is important. Fair, fair enough. Fair enough. I, I accept your comment. I accept your comment. But I think if at all you want some union to be taken place, then probably one may consider that. Yeah, uh, agree. My fear is, sir, we are on a, we are on a, lens on a, we are a lot of media the hearing. So whatever we say may be followed across. So use of teleparent yeah. can get misused here. Yeah, and that's right. I agree. I agree. One, 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 now, no, I, I would, I would wait. I would, is... yeah, I agree, agree. I think I would, I would wait for him to become symptomatic. I agree with that. Yeah, she think is going to do a, I mean, showing a video demonstration of C1C2. Before that, yeah, yeah, she think. There any questions? Before? Sorry, can you hear? Yeah, you can hear you. So this, you may have to speak. This this may not. No, no, no the video is uh, not speaking. Only I can hear you per se. So you may have to speak. You can't hear the video. No, 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 no. Oh, no. Okay, wait a minute. Let me speak. You have to when you share the screen, you have to. I, I put, shared the screen. Yeah, left side button, lower button, left side. You have to just tick that when you share the screen. I shared the screen, it's open. Left lower button. But mute, mute button, maybe you are not unmuted. No, no, but it's, no it's unmuted. It's no, no, unmuted. no, 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 not that. But your voice will not play, you will have to speak. No, no, so that's what I'm saying. Play. Can you, can you uh, hear? Can you hear it? Yeah, no. Listen, Shitik, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I know how to unmute it. I know how to unmute it. Can you, you hear? You need it? to go off the Bluetooth. Can you That's hear? Yeah, go off the Bluetooth. No, can you, not can you hear? Okay, okay. No harm. Okay, 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 please okay fine, fine. Quiet. Shitik. Wait a minute, I'll start again. I'll start. Let's not okay. Time okay, yeah. let's I am playing playing. Thank you very much. Uh, this uh, let me mute this video. So okay, though this procedure is uh, close to my heart because it was first described by my mentor, Dr. Vinod Lahiri, along with Dr. Atul Goel. And I was fortunate to learn this procedure from them. So the surgery starts with preoperative planning. And the importance of CT angiogram cannot be overemphasized. Now, let's look at the feasibility of the C1 lateral mass screw. Uh, now, there are two kinds of C1 screws. The first is the conventional entry point below the arch. And then there is the C1 posterior arch screw that grows through the arch. So look out for vertebral artery anomalies, especially these variations where the VA is coursing below the C1 arch. In these situations, it's quite unsafe to pass a C1 lateral mass screw. The other common anomaly is the ponticulus posticus. And if you are unaware of this, then a C1 posterior arch screw can be a dangerous screw. Coming to the C2 pedicle screw planning, carefully look at the V1 part of the vertebral artery. The C2 pedicle screw is unsafe if the VA is too medial or if it is high riding. For this, the CT anatomy has to be looked in the trajectory of the screw. And this requires multiplanar reformatting in non-orthogonal planes. Either you can do this yourself or you can go to the radiology department uh, and ask your radiologist to do this for you. So the positioning of the patient is the same as a transarticular screw, uh, the military tuck on a Mayfield or a Gardner Wells, but as opposed to the transarticular screw technique, an anatomical reduction is not necessary. In this construct, the alignment can be achieved by manipulating on the rods. The usual subperiosteal exposure is carried out first of the C2 and then of the C1 posterior arch. Here I am identifying the midline tubercle of the C1 and exposing the posterior arch. And in this region, especially on the upper border of the posterior arch, you have to be careful of the V3 segment of the vertebral artery. Uh, it is usually 1.5 centimeters away from the midline and you have to keep your cautery on low. I generally like to insert the C1 screws before 
uh, putting in the C2 pedicle screws. Uh, so for this step, the 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 in the most uh, initial step to do is dissecting the posterior atlantoaxial membrane of the posterior C1 arch. Now this gives an access uh, or a subperiosteal access to the lateral mass and avoids bleeding from the venous plexus. Then using a pen field one, push the C2 ganglion downwards to expose the base of the posterior arch. And if one is careful, very little bleeding is encountered if it is done this way. The next step is to identify the medial border of the C1 lateral mass with a pen field four uh, like this. Now, the, the next step is a, uh, is a crucial step and your assistant should know how to hold instruments uh, for you. I'm a left-handed surgeon, so the two millimeter burr is in my left hand. The sucker tip is in my right hand and it is at the lateral border of the lateral mass. My assistant is holding down the C2 ganglion with a Penfield 1 and the medial border of the lateral mass is holding a Penfield 4 to show me the entire width of the lateral mass. Usually with this trick, not much bleeding is encountered and if there is bleeding, it is usually behind the assistant's Penfield 4 where you can place a cottonoid uh, and then continue working. Uh, the next step uh, after this is you'll have to burr somewhere in the middle of the lateral mass, uh, the overhang, uh, which can prevent you from taking a trajectory that is uh, parallel to the undersurface uh, of the C1 arch. So either you can use a burr uh, or you can use a kerosene punch uh, to take out the notch like this. Now use a two millimeter burr. Uh, here I'm creating the pathway for the C1 screw. Now make sure on the lateral fluoroscopy, the direction of the drill is towards the lower half of the C1 anterior tubercle. <coughs> the trajectory is uh, slightly convergent medially to avoid the nerves and vessels anteriorly. And I usually try to go for a bicortical screw purchase uh, in the lateral mass. Once that is done, uh, check for the integrity of the walls, uh, check for the uh, length of the screw from the posterior arch and not from the base, tap carefully and insert the C1 screw with a smooth shank so that the threads uh, don't irritate the C2 ganglion. Now, alternatively, you can use the C1 posterior arch screw, which theoretically can avoid the irritation of the C2 ganglion. Uh, but for this, you have to dissect the V3 segment of the vertebral artery off the superior border of the posterior arch uh, like this and pack it away with gel foam and cottonoid and then keep a pen field one before, below the posterior arch and an angle curate above it like this to uh, judge for its thickness. Uh, the medial border is already marked with a marker and then with a two millimeter burr, make the entry point directly through the arch. So once that is done, then take a 2.5 millimeter drill bit uh, uh, to create the uh, trajectory. Mm -hmm. And on the lateral fluoro, direct this in the middle of the anterior tubercle or in the lower half. So this way you can avoid getting into the plexus or near the ganglion. Tap this hole uh, again while protecting the uh, uh, structures around it uh, and palpate the margins again with a feeler, check for the length. So all the time your assistant has to keep this instruments in place. And then a 3.5 millimeter screw, a fully threaded screw is passed like this. And this is the post-op X-ray. This is how it looks like. Now coming to the C2 pedicle screw. So the first step uh, in the C2 pedicle screw is to access the C1, C2 joint. I mean, this is optional. Use a periosteum elevator to walk down the pars until the periosteum enters the joint and lever it open and hand over the periosteum to your assistant. Uh, this will keep the C2 ganglion retracted upwards and expose the anatomy uh, in this region. Then the crucial step here is to identify the medial border of the uh, C2 pedicle with a Penfield 4 like this. <clears throat> and this is going to be the land landmark that we'll have to follow for uh, inserting the C2 pedicle screw. Now the entry point for the C2 pedicle screw is in line with the medial border. You have to extrapolate that line uh, on the pars where it meets the superior border of the lamina. Usually that's a good entry point and the entry point uh, like that where you are seeing is usually in the superior medial quadrant of the pars and the direction is medially along the uh, medial border that you have palpated before. Now, once that is done, use a three millimeter pedicle probe and uh, cannulate the C2 pedicle 
using lateral fluoroscopy on the lateral view the direction is just underneath the dorsal surface of the pars and in the coronal plane it is directed visually along the medial border about 20 to 30 <laughs> degrees medially con convergent so after that check the integrity of the walls check the length and then tap it carefully and here we are using a 4 mm screw that is 28 mm long and notice that the assistant is constantly showing the medial border and the dorsal surface of the pars while you are doing this then use a rod to connect the screws at these at this step you can manipulate the reduction if required the relative position of the tulips will correct the anterior and posterior displacement rotatory subluxation can also be corrected at this step and then finally tighten the screw using a torque uh, limiter uh, and then burr the posterior elements, lay on lay bone graft from the iliac crest. What I have not shown here is that I like to burr into the joint before the rods are placed. So the joints also can be packed with bone graft. So that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Shitij. Please unshare your screen. And we will go back to Ajay. Ajay, please share your screen again and we can go from there. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Shidik has uh, demonstrated. So there is not much of question. There is one question on the Ortho TV group, uh, Ajay, which is for you. And that is, if there is a C1 arch fracture along with the odontoid fracture, how should we deal with it? It's better to go from behind. It's a variant. It will be more mobile. You can go from behind and do a C1, C2 fixation. It could be temporary or it could be a permanent C1, C2 fusion. Anybody else differs on that? So does it depend upon the integrity of the transverse atlantal ligament along with the C1 arch fracture? Yeah, usually yes, but is uh, but whatever cases we have seen is not a very common injury, but uh, is a very rare injury. And what we have seen is that the associated injury, there is displacement between the C1, C2 joint. Therefore, we tend to uh, fix it from behind and fuse it. I'll skip this part. Yeah. Shitij, question. Go to the next case. Yeah, question. By, question for Shitij from the yeah. audience. Shitij, yeah. there is a lot of bleeding in the C1, C2 area next to the nerve root. Right. Because of the venous plexus. How do you deal with that? So, uh, that's what I showed on the video. There is a trick of not getting into the plexus. The first step is to first dissect the C2, then dissect the C1, and then stay above the plexus while you are doing a lateral dissection. Then the second thing is when you are doing the C1 lateral mass screw, you have to stay, stay subperiosteal. You have to make sure that you have disconnected the posterior atlantoaxial membrane and then gradually strip away things downwards. If you try to use bipolars in this region, they are just going to open because uh, the, these venous sinuses are very large and these bipolars won't be able to stop them uh, unless you kind of take the whole thing off uh, like Dr. Atul Goel does. But, uh, uh, but if you are going to not take the whole thing off, then stay subperiosteal. And then uh, there are only a certain regions where the bleeding happens. So you need to know those areas where the bleeding happens. Usually on the medial side at the C1 uh, area where you can pack a patty and then that usually stops it. And the second area of that uh, bleeds uh, is, is on the medial border of the pars uh, inside. So that's the common areas where there is bleeding that you should anticipate. So otherwise, it is a pretty uh, right. Thank uh, you. bloodless procedure. Atam, can I make two points? Yes. Yeah, okay. Um, I think just a little addition to what Shiti is saying. I think if you do get into a situation where there is a lot of bleeding, so I'm assuming that we have gone past the avoiding the bleeding stage, then the thing that really helps is to put a piece of uh, gel foam and uh, tail cotton and then just press and hold the pressure for two to three minutes and usually the bleeding will stop. So if you find that there is uncontrolled bleeding, I agree with Chitish, don't try to keep buzzing it because that just causes more and more bleeding. Just put a one centimeter by one centimeter piece of gel foam and put a cotton tail on it and just press it down 
for two or three minutes, and that will normally stop the bleeding. Thank you, Vijay. We'll move on to the next case. This is a type 3 wooden tight fracture in a patient who is 75 years of age. And uh, I know that all of us will choose conservative treatment. Dr. Sivasa, what would be your line of conservative treatment in a type 3 wooden tight fractures? Is it necessary to use halo vest, somi brace, or is Philadelphia collar or a hard collar alone is adequate? I think the hard collar has worked very well in all these situations. Main thing is that we have to uh, explain to the patient what should be the position of the neck and they are not supposed to take it out every time they want to do some activity at home. This is extremely important and many of them, I would say almost all of them, they unite. Unless they have some problem of uh, significant osteoporosis along with it. So in that case, one has to give medical treatment also and all of them unite. Usually in these uh, in elderly patients, only sometime we make some extension to the, uh, you know, it is like a uh, cervical thoracic uh, brace, rigid brace. Otherwise, hard cervical collar or a snugly fitting collar, it works very well. Yeah, thank you, sir. That's what the literature does say, that hard cervical collar is more than adequate in most of these particular patients, especially if it's a uh, straightforward type 3 wooden type fracture. As you can see, this patient was treated with that, and at the end of so, uh, this is, I think it's six to eight months. Uh, this is what is about, and this is one more case example of a younger guy with a type three type of wooden tight fracture treated conservatively. Again, the same way with a good uh, result. I'll come to a third case. Is a young nursing student with a history of RTA. Uh, she was going in the ambulance to drop a patient, and the ambulance had an accident. Uh, she's a known visa, and this is what her uh, CT scan uh, looks like. Sajesh, what do you think? What type of fracture it is? Is it a classical type two fracture, type three fracture, or is it a variant? It's a variant. It's a variant uh, type two okay. variant fracture, and it is uh, there is a it's a combinator fracture too, and. Uh, but it's not displaced as such. It is not di displaced as such, yes. And the seven c to joint is normal, yeah. So what will you do? I think because, uh, I'll go from posterior. I'll do a posterior fixation for this patient. Seven c to fixation. Okay, Vishal, what will be your approach for this patient? So if you're uh, going anterior, you're doing conservative or surgical? So this is a star esmond variant. They are grossly unstable. You know, they, where the fracture line extends from the base of odontoid all the way into the pars. If you see on one side, one of the pars is also broken. So this is neither a frank hangman's fracture nor a frank type two odontoid fracture. It's a star esmond variant where there is a shear component involved to the fracture also. And these are grossly unstable. However, in this particular case, if you see it, there is quite a bit of impaction there. And that's why the chances of this healing with only halo waste is also uh, very high. Uh, having said that, my personal choice would be in this particular patient to do a transarticular screw fixation and stabilize it surgically. But uh, I think this can be conservatively treated. Yes, yes. I think this is conservative. We did try conservative yeah. treatment, but not with yeah. halo waste. But with a yeah. Philadelphia collar with a roost type of yeah, 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 yeah. This can be conservatively treated. It's a very well large well cancellous area. It can oh, be very well treated. The CT scan at three yeah. weeks. If you put so a halo waste, probably weeks. yes. Yeah. If not, this is what happened at three weeks. You can see that the fracture is tended to angulate and it started to move. I not put the X-ray pictures, but then I just wanted to highlight the fact that so you have to be extremely careful with these type of injuries. Especially, you can see the fracture line is extending laterally. As Vishal mentioned, sorry. As Vishal mentioned, the fracture line is extending laterally. And these type of things, I mean, it may look like a benign based on the AP view. But if you look at the axial cut, the fracture line is a variant. And I also thought probably it could suffice with the Philadelphia collar, which is cancellous bone. But I think if a halovus would have been an option. But if not, I think we should consider a posterior C1C2. Fixation. I will just uh, show one more case. Uh, Bharat, what will you do for a case like this? He comes three months post injury, three weeks, normal neuro neurology, but you can see there is a subluxation between the C1 C2 joint. But on the right side, 
the whole thing is shattered. Even there is a fracture involving the joint at C1, C2. Yeah, MRI, neurology normal? Neurology normal. normal. I think I probably I will need more cuts to see as well. And probably maybe CT, NG as well. Some more, some more evaluation. I would still I give it a conservative. I would still give it a conservative trial with the view that you know this will give neck pain in future, but I still will conserve to begin with because three weeks old injury. Actually, when he came, he had a, a X-rays. I didn't put because of the want of time. I didn't want to show too many pictures. There is a subluxation between C1, C2. As we can see, the joint over here. There is a subluxation between C1 and C2. There is a yeah. break in the parts. Yeah. There is a total comminuted uh, part of the C2 on the right side, which involves mm. the pedicle aspect also. Vishal, what will you do? So, uh, like Dr. Bharat mentioned, I, I, I fail to agree that there is comminution. If you have the coronal images, if you are trying to uh, focus, I, I really cannot appreciate if there is any comminution. The borders of the... Both are, here. are quite smooth to tell that it is community. It's just an oblique view, coronal oblique view. And, and I personally feel that on one side, yes, there is a kind of hangman's parse fracture on one side. On the other side, what I am able to appreciate is that there is either a high riding vertebral artery or it's a oblique view. So it's one, uh, if it's an oblique view, uh, then I would want to see the parse diameter. If the yeah. parse diameter permits me to put in pass in a three millimeter screw, I think this is a straightforward case for a transarticular for me. But if the pass diameter is less than three millimeter, if the vertebral artery is really high riding on that side, and like Dr. Bharat mentioned that the, because even on coronal images, I feel this thing, what you are saying, communication is probably either a vascular component or something. So we should surely evaluate what is happening on no, that. No, there, are, there are pictures I didn't save in this. Uh, uh, this then you thing. mean that there is no high riding vertebral artery? No, that, 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 that part of the vertebra on that side is totally disrupted for any sort of fixation. But anyway, I just wanted to highlight the fact is that we, we gave them a traction, the fracture aligned, but basically to show Translaminous that where you could use that is translaminous true true. True. as one of the fixation options. Okay. Yes. Okay. This is, uh, what do we do for a situation like this? I just limited the number of cuts so that the X-rays will become significantly lesser. There's one more case, a variant. There is a hangman component. There is a odontoid fracture. There is a combination of the C1, C2 joint on the left side. C1, C2 transarticular. I'll <laughs> conserve. Okay, but yeah, okay. Uh, we did fix it with a uh, good outcome. And there are a lot of literature for these variants where people have tried temporary fixation and removed it after some time. Okay, I will just uh, move on to just skip this because of want of time. Uh, we'll come to the type 2 odontoid fractures in the elderly. I mean, the common aim is to fusion a stable fibrous union. I'm sorry, the x ray is not there. What do we do in a situation like this? Elderly patient with a odontoid fracture, 80 years old patient. But at yeah, I think again, probably, you know, uh, I would go over the flexion extension x-ray again. I think probably it will be quite unstable as well. So I would still 80 year, active 80 year, one may consider fixes. And if it is not, then probably one can observe them. In our setup, what normally we do is to give the Philadelphia collar and then see the x-ray with the Philadelphia collar. And every week we observe them. And we feel that if it is staying there, we may continue conservative treatment and be aggressive in the osteoplastic management. Uh, 80 year, I repeat, if it is good, young acti activity, one may consider fixation. Otherwise, I would conserve them. Uh, Gautam, what will be your choice in uh, elderly osteoporotic fractures? Your aim is to achieve fusion or achieve a fibrous union so that the patient is comfortable. So, in my practice, I'm extremely conservative in terms of treating patients, elderly patients who are frail. They frequently fall at home, develop a slight head injury. They, they develop an odontoid fracture, which is usually missed primarily. And these patients, if they are out neurology, even if the fracture is slightly displaced, I treat them just with a soft collar 
and they seem to be very comfortable with that and i must say that i have yet to see in treating more than 25 patients a patient who has worsened neurology you may have a patient whose displacement may worsen worsen a little bit but neurology has not worsened in any of these patients and this goes along with a study which came from mark swintowski et al from from washington state where they had studied 25 similar patients early patients where they had treated with uh, just a soft collar and these patients went on to develop fibrous union and did not develop a secondary neurologic deficit Okay. So yes, my treatment would be conservative for this patient. I I I would be I would be worried about the soft collar. I would give them the Philadelphia collar and keep changing every week because Philadelphia will collar will control the rotation as well. It will give the chin support as well, and you keep changing every week because it will soften as well. So have the X-ray, serial X-ray, and then they keep changing the Philadelphia collar. This is one of the uh, controversial. at the literature on collars yeah. not even a halo vest can control rotation at c1 yeah. c2 agree so agree. a philadelphia collar is a sham compared to a soft collar um <laughs> i think don't give the you know <laughs> no no we just go ahead yeah, uh, go with ahead. the uh, literature this thing we did the fusion but however if you look at the literature uh, majority of the literature which is coming from the european side there is evidence to suggest both conservative and the uh, surgical wise there is no major difference people have used uh, transarticular screws and they say transarticular screws is slightly better when compared to anterior wooden tied screws people also used anterior c1 c2 along with wooden tied screws and say the results are better in elderly patient there is a group which has studied using uh, cement augmentation after putting the screw at the base uh you inject cement through using a jamshed needle having said that overall assessment of the meta analysis says there is no definitive conclusion basically there are a lot of papers which support the fact that conservative treatment in this elderly patient with any sort of even the soft collar or a filled fake collar they tend to have some degree of fibrous movement there could be some displacement but result wise there is no major difference but, and uh, that's what it's about because of the one of time i'll move on to the next case the odontoid non union c122 c1 c2 subluxation in myelopathy they are late presentation missed injuries failed treatment what is important to assess in these patients is whether it's reducible or irreducible the reducibility can be seen by x ray and uh, it is a good case for uh, c1 c2 transarticular which we shall will be going to demonstrate within few minutes time and you can also look for reducibility when you are asking for a ct you can ask them to do a dynamic ct which also helps you to identify the amount of reducibility along with the uh, anatomy of the particular region and uh, this is an example one of the easiest way to ready identify is by drawing drawing a swiss chuck line that is the line connecting the spinal laminar aspect of c1 to c3 as you can see on the left the gap is of the c2 spinal laminar line and the swiss chuck line the gap is more than 2 mm whereas when you extend you see that is reducible therefore a reducible c1 c2 is relatively easy even though it's a no odontoid non union we know that we can address it by c1 c2 fusion either it could be transarticular or a c1 c2 uh, goel hams technique okay this is one of one such example well and uh, next we'll have the video demonstration of c1 c2 transarticular by vishal thank you ajay while while vishal is setting up there is a question on uh, youtube for you if the patient along with the c2 fracture has a c1 fracture and the c1 fracture is displaced la uh, lateral masses are displaced laterally because the transarticular atlantal ligament is ruptured how do you realign the lateral masses how do you bring them back medially the and realignment of a acute uh, unstable c1 fracture is quite simple <laughs> moment you position the patient with the mayfield on and give the traction it usually reduces the technique to reduce a, a unstable c1 fracture is by giving traction and you can give it by conservative method you can give traction and reduce it but takes a longer duration of time But the simplest way on the table moment you place on the mayfield 
and give a gentle traction. Usually the C1, the unstable part of C1 ring, which is displaced outwards will come into alignment. And, but in these scenarios, if you're going to intervene, you need to have a occipital cervical fixation, which could be temporary till the fracture heals, but usually the OC1 joints will be disrupted and probably will end up having a fusion at that particular point. Vishal. Right. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. I think it's very interesting. Thank you so much for bringing it up. So, uh, transarticular screws, uh, we all know that uh, odontoid fractures, I think, broadly can be made into two, what Dr. Ajay has mentioned. The favorable anatomy is there where the fracture line is conducive, anterior screw fixation is the one. However, most of the fractures, if not all, have some kind of unfavorable anatomy where posterior fixation becomes the norm and anterior fixation is either not possible or not the best conducive uh, option available. Like with reverse oblique fracture, transverse ligament injuries, comminuted fractures, elderly patients, non-union, small proximal fragment, and also star resident variants like we just saw in the last few slides. In all these patients, posterior fixation is the choice of fixation. And when it comes to posterior fixation, C1, C2, segmental fixation or transarticular screw are the two options available. Of course, translaminar screws can be used in combination with C1 screws. Here we'll see transarticular screw fixation technique. Now, why transarticular screw? I think we all know that the fusion rates of transarticular screw are far more and the absolute stability with transarticular screw makes it a new gold standard in C1-C2 fixation. And that's why I would say that transarticular screw is the gold standard for posterior C1-C2 stabilization. However, yes, it is demanding. It has challenges associated with it and problems are sometimes disastrous. But all these problems can be averted by meticulous pre-operative planning. I'm sure we all follow this. However, just for the sake of uh, revising them, I would say that all this planning can be divided into pre-operative and intra-operative steps. Pre-operatively, few things that are very, very important that we all must understand is to understand that whether transarticular screw is feasible or not must be ascertained pre-operatively. Transarticular screw is allowed and recommended only when there is a reversible AAD or a reversible reducible C1C2 subluxation is there. In patients with malunited or irreversible AADs, you are, the transarticular screw is a strict contraindication. In patients with high riding vertebral artery, again, uh, one must apply transarticular screw fixation and recommend that that sparse diameter should be minimum three millimeters to do a transarticular screw fixation for being anatomically conducive. Also remember, like in or anterior odontoid screw barrel chest, where it becomes a contraindication in patients with thoracic kyphosis, the trajectory required for transarticular screw fixation may not be possible. And that's why preoperatively one must ascertain whether surgical feasibility is present or not. Once you've chosen the right patient, once you know that transarticular screw is feasible, it is very important to understand that transarticular screw implants available currently in market are minimum diameter of three millimeter. And that's why this diameter, which is the minimum pass diameter should be more than three millimeters to keep the screw in there and preventing the dorsal burst out of these uh, screws there. And that's why this is the second prerequisite for doing a transarticular screw fixation. And that's why a CT scan preferably along with a CT angiograph should see these images where the PA MPD should be more than three millimeters to get the screw placed in this particular dimension. Now, how do we plan the trajectory? Uh, conventional magnal screws mentions a standard entry point and a standard exit point. However, uh, there is a little change that we follow in our practice is that we consider that the exit point is fixed. So if I had to say one thing, the exit point is in always zone one and zone two. This is the fixed point and the entry point is always tailor-made. So the, the point is exit point that you have to look into CM and remain, make it a fixed entry point where the tip of your screw should touch, which should be in the zone one and zone two of the interior arch. However, the entry point of the screw will be based on the retrograde trajectory that one plans by joining the exit point through the next point of the path. So this is something that we all must understand that this one step makes your screw absolutely feasible. Even in patient with high riding vertebral artery, we have been able to do even in patient with just three millimeter parse, we are able to do a transarticular screw and purely based on this one fact that keep your exit point absolutely fixed get your entry point tailor make it is not the fixed point and get a retrograde trajectory this again is purely based on how well you visualize this portion of the parse while your dissection is happening and that's the crux of exposure in transarticular screw fixation there Positioning, like Dr. Gautam Zaveri mentioned, I think all C1-C2 fixations, whenever we do reducible C1-C2 fixations, you need to understand what military chin tuck position is, where you get extension at the whole sub subaxial spine, whereas you get 
flexion, slight flexion at the C1-C2 joint to get the trajectory in such a manner that the entry point comes in line with the thoracic hump there. Otherwise, in patient with very, very muscular built or in patient with thoracic kyphosis, you may not get the desired trajectory to get the transarticular screw from C2 all the way into the C1 lateral mass. So allow some uh, military chin tuck position even before you're planning to get your drape or painting done. And that's why it is very important to keep your painting and position in such a way that your head is high, you have a military check position and also always allow some flexibility to the neck possible because even before your draping comes, you have to ensure that you have reduced the fracture there. Unless and until you are able to see that the C1 is reduced completely on C2, please don't attempt a transarticular fixation. And that is something that is very important. And reduction pre-draping is absolute must. And for this to ascertain, you must understand that a C-arm image, which is a true lateral image, must be obtained while you are ascertaining reduction. Of course, in a patient with irreducible uh, C1-C2 subluxation, you can use wires in the C1 arch, or you can use intra-operative, uh, intra-articular joint distraction mechanisms, you can push the C2 with the thumb, and all this will help you to distract the joint and get reduction there. But preferably in your first few cases, try to get the reduction of C1 completely on the C2 so that your transarticular screw trajectory can be planned pre-operatively even before your incision comes. And what I mean by true lateral image, this is something that is very, very important to get your screw bang in the middle of the pars and the isthmus is that you must understand that these two lines decide that they are absolutely parallel. There is no overlapping shadow. And then you should be able to see the C1 lateral mass and you should also be able to see the C1 anterior arch. Unless you've seen all these three in your CRM image pre-operatively, don't try to start your surgery. And this is the only position that should be considered acceptable for doing a transarticular screw. This will reduce your misplacement of the screw significantly uh, to, a, to a acceptable levels. Once you ascertain that, then comes your draping. You drape all the way from the mid of the occiput all the way to the T3, T5 of the thoracic spine. Remember that the screw comes percutaneously and the incision for this percutaneous screw is in the range of T1 to T2 spinous process and that's why your drape has to be really far away. You have to keep the surgical side quite wide exposed and also keep the occiput uh, open up, I mean the, the drape quite well and exposed because sometimes you may have to convert transarticular screw into an occipital cervical fixation or you may actually have to do a wiring and that's why keep yourself prepared intraoperatively even before. So draping is something that you may also want to consider as a planning measure. Inventory, uh, Dr. Satish mentioned about the Herbert screw. Sometimes when your past diameter is less than three millimeters, you can actually use a 2.6 millimeter or even a 2.4 millimeter Herbert screw. And that's why it should be a standard in, uh, inventory that you should have it around there. I always do these procedures under microscope and having a good CM broad field of vision to see all the way from occiput all the way to C4, C5. And sometimes if you can get six vertebrae, you can actually see the entry point going all the way up to the T1 to get single shoot and reduce the radiation there. Remember, bipolars of very high quality are very, very absolutely important because dissection in the area of the pars cannot happen with the bovi cautery, which can spray or current and result into vertebral artery injuries. And that's why impedance cautery is something very important. Candulated drill and high-speed burr should be kept in hand and flow seal gel foam should be in your OT complex just in case to be prepared for vascular injuries happening around there. The steps are as conventional, like Dr. Shetish mentioned. Your exposure is midline incision with three centimeters centered over the C2 spinous process. Remember, do not expose anything above the superior arch of C1. The moment you expose anything above C1 superior arch, the problems are that inadvertent OC fusions can happen. And if you expose anything below C2, C3, you can have C2, 3 fusions, which are inadvertent unplanned. And that's why keep your exposure absolutely minimum limited only to the spinous process and lamina of the C2. And all this exposure has to be subperiosteal all the period of time. Then comes the part, the most important part is to expose the pars. And this is the most important part because you have to visualize the dorsal part of the pars and enter into the joint where you can actually do a joint jamming and reduction also. And as I mentioned, under CM, decide your exit point, get your retrograde trajectory, and entry point can then be visualized with the help of percutaneous screws, then your screws come in. Just to show the video of the surgery, the incision is based three centimeters on the spinous process. That's the head side, that's the foot side. And this picture, if you see the odontoid is placed like that. This is the part where you may want to see that this is the spinous process. That's the lamina of C2 and your cautery works on the parts there, continues working and you feel the C1 arch, but do not go above the superior aspect of C1 arch. Dissect between the C1 and C2 with the help of your boy. And that's the time when you reach the lateral aspect of the lamina. That's when you get in your impedance bipolar. And then only with the help of your lamina and, and lamina spreader or McDonald or Penfield, you can actually see the whole of pars visible right in front of you and you can plan your retrograde trajectory. So that's the whole pars. 
and and under exit exit point is seen and see and with the visualization of the whole path you can actually retrograde place where your entry point is going to be getting a tailor made entry point after your full exposure looks like this that's when your t1 incision comes and your sort of sleeved guide wire comes in and under siam guidance that's when your this is now a completely siam guided procedure where you keep your guide wires absolutely in touch with the dorsal aspect of the pars and you can actually visualize it passing through the joint and this is all under siam guidance keeping the guide wire always stuck to the dorsal most part of the pars there where you can actually visualize right in front of your eyes that the pars is not perforated by the guide wire there the trajectory is 10 to 15 degrees laterally from midline to the lateral aspect and once your screw goes in over the guide wire you drill you put in your screws there appropriate length and the only thing that remains is putting in your morselized allo graft we never use supplemental wiring in any of our patients and we have been able to achieve almost 100% fusion if not posteriorly intraarticular always you'll be able to see fusion at the end of 6 to 12 months some case examples reverse oblique odontoid fracture anterior odontoid screw which was done for this patient failed and we did a posterior transarticular screw fixation a patient with transverse ligament injury with a chip fracture of the ala again a transarticular screw fixation was done another patient with a very small proximal fragment again anterior screw was not feasible in a posterior transarticular screw fixation with a wonderfully seen fusion mass with help of allo graft is noticed here another patient with comminuted fracture of odontoid in an elderly patient again transarticular screw this time we use a navigation in this particular patient because one of the side was having a narrow pass another patient with a variant and a star resement variant again we did a transarticular fixation another variant and we did a transarticular screw fixation these patients so odontoid fractures there are some most of them will have some or the other unfavorable anatomy making posterior fixation is the choice of fixation uh, when it comes to posterior fixation i still vouch and recommend that transarticular is the new gold standard of posterior fixation yes it is demanding but pre operative planning can really ensure 75% success already in the in the in this surgery even before your incision comes up and remember soft tissue dissection along with being pre armed and pre warned is the success to transarticular screw Thank you very much, Vishal. That was wonderful. We go back to Ajoy, but uh, before we go back to Ajoy, I have a few couple of questions for Vishal. You know, in a patient who has an anterior subluxation of the uh, odontoid, anterior displacement of the fracture fragment. Now, when you put the patient on the prone position for a C1 C2 transarticular screw, the reduction comes only when you extend the neck. On the other hand, the more you extend the neck more difficult does the c1 c2 transarticular screw become so how do you manage the position in these patients so very interesting question dr gautam in fact if you just heard that that military chuck position doesn't means giving extension at the at the c1 c2 angulation it is the translation that will get you reduction so if it is a acute fracture it is only by military tuck position allowing the extension only and only in the form of translation rather than angulation and this that's why i said that even before your drapes come you have to ensure that you are on your patient is on traction and with the help of your traction you not only get a posterior translation by getting the horseshoe little higher place but also ensuring that the extension doesn't gives you angulation at the c1 c2 joint and that's exactly what the importance of military tuck chin position is and you you i mean almost every single time you'll be able to get good not only good reduction but also a true lateral image where you can really plan your screw trajectory even before your incision comes in right uh, another right. question yeah. vishal is that you started off with a good reduction but intraoperatively as you are ready to getting ready to pass the screw you notice that the anterior subluxation has recurred a little bit so you want to get a better reduction should you abandon transarticular screw and go for the c1 lateral mass technique or is there something you can do intraoperatively to get the reduction back very interesting again dr gautam i think how to achieve reduction if the anterior translation recurs while while uh, intraoperatively position of screw is the simplest technique is the thumb technique ask your assistant to push the c2 if you push the c2 the anterior placed c1 this c2 will go and get placed under the c1 so this is the simplest technique however if your thumb is not able to push it you can actually with the help of towel clip put in under the c1 arch and pull it so this both combination will be able to give you a good reduction just in case you are not able to get despite the thumb push and pull of the c1 arch you can actually go inside the joint and distract it and this distraction will always always get the c1 over the c2 and you will be able to get your good trajectory in there right and thank and you very much sir gautam very very nice to pass it on gautam yes to your point it is when the you achieved the reduction in the beginning but it displaced during the procedure for such thing 
if you use the mayfield or sugita frame in the beginning you know that will never happen and i in addition to the traction with only gw especially in a transarticular screw fixation if you use the fixed frames you know you will be much more comfortable than anything else so dr satish i completely agree that using a fixed frame is a good idea however many a times the fixed frame once you have positioned and got a siam picture and if you are able to see that it is not reduced it is really cumbersome to do this movement get siam yeah. images and then fix it at that position if you are using a fixed arm and that's why mayfield when you have a completely mobile uh, c1 c2 or, or a acute odontoid fracture i would recommend use a horseshoe you know in that in that situation so a mayfield tuck is mayfield a military tuck is possible with a mayfield much better than a gardner yes but reduction may not so you can you can do a military tuck perfectly with a mayfield right and you know you can manipulate during the surgery also yeah, with the mayfield it's, uh, so mayfield. it's not a problem yeah. much easier so to do it problem of course satish shitij is that a lot of surgeons who work in smaller hospitals not necessarily yeah they don't have it the mayfield yeah. in fact for years together my neurosurgeons in jaslo hospital did not allow me to use their mayfield yeah. and so i had to Because struggle with a horseshoe yeah. right then you get used to it can i mention one thing yeah then you get used to it you actually rather like it than mayfield yeah So yeah, let's go back, Ajay, quickly. No, but it's already we are reaching six o'clock. Yeah, I think we will. Uh, Gautam, you can think... summarize. Yes. Yeah. Okay, so we start with summarization of the session. So, friends, I hope you've enjoyed this session today, or or the master series as organized by the ASSI is has be, is going to be a regular event. the next event is on the 7th of june which is a sunday at 4 pm where we are going to have a session on congenital cranio vertebral anomalies and we will have a star faculty and we will be requesting dr satish to present his work his interesting cases and lead the discussion on that issue in the meanwhile odontoid fractures i think about constitute about 15% of all fractures within the cervical spine the caveats are that whenever there is a c2 fracture you must look for a head injury in such a patient you must look for a c1 arch fracture and you must look for other subaxial fracture cervical spine fractures in this patient usually there is something associated in the low in the younger age group these are high velocity injuries often comminuted in the older age group the fractures are typically low velocity injuries because of a fall in the uh, patient has had giddiness and fall the treatment dramatically differs based upon what is the age of the patient in a younger patient one tries to be more aggressive one tries to save the mobility of the c1 c2 joint and therefore the treatment would differ, would probably be more aggressive in terms of osteosynthesis of the fracture in the elderly age group surgery is a little bit dangerous because these people are frail they have multiple comorbidities and therefore after surgery their survival is not necessarily very good there is a high risk of complication and therefore conservative treatment can be done there is plenty of literature to show that conservative treatment in the form of a soft collar a philadelphia collar works it does not help with union of the fracture it does not but these patients they develop some kind of fibrous union and even though they are slightly displaced a large percentage of them don't go on to develop neurological deficit the neurological deficit in these patients is if it does occur then one might be forced to go in for surgery or if there is a significant mobile displacement one would think of surgery in the younger individuals there are three i mean as such there are three types of odontoid fractures the type 1 fracture which is of the tip of the odontoid yes. is generally treated non operatively unless but you must confirm that this and differentiate it from an os odontoidium in an os odontoidium the upper surface will be like an ossicle it will have sclerotic rounded margins and not a fresh fracture os odontoidium can be unstable and result in c1 c2 subluxation and requires surgery 
the type 3 fracture on the other hand it goes through the vertebral body through the cancellous part of the vertebral body is usually a much more stable fracture treating them with a philadelphia collar or somi brace is good enough a majority of these patients will heal conservatively over 8 to 12 weeks and do not require surgery. The dilemma for us is when it is a type 2 fracture. Bear in mind that even then, about two-thirds of type 2 fractures will heal non-operatively if treated well. So an undisplaced fracture, a fracture where there is very little displacement of the fracture fragments, can be and in a relatively young patient can be treated non-operatively. In these patients, the method of treatment is a halo vest immobilization, which one would consider for eight to twelve weeks. Following that, one would do a CT scan, see if there is healing of the fracture, and do dynamic views to confirm everything. If it has healed, very good. If it does not, then we have to think about what we do. The other way of treatment is. What is the preferred method in a younger patient is an anterior odontoid screw fixation. The challenge in the odont anterior odontoid screw fixation, it's a very exacting technique. But more important than that is the patient selection. As mentioned by all our more panelists here today, a fracture line which is not perpendicular to the trajectory of the screw is not a good indication. Old fractures, comminuted fractures, fractures which are in non-union, and fractures where there is a rupture of the transverse arteries, atlantal ligament, are not patients in whom we think of doing an anterior odontoid screw fixation. Besides that, there are patient habitus, as uh, Satish mentioned. If it's an obese patient whose chest is coming up very high, if it's an ankylosing spondylitis patient with a significant kyphosis, these patients, you will not be able to get a proper trajectory and therefore may be contraindications for an anterior odontoid screw. The second group of surgeries is a posterior surgery. Whilst one would like to do an anterior surgery whenever possible to save the mobility of the C1-C2 joint, I think our first goal is always to do the least possible damage and to do the surgery safely if possible. As Vishal mentioned, anterior odontoid screw has more contraindications than indications. And therefore, often you are left with the option of doing a posterior surgery. The C1, C2 transarticular screw, as Vishal showed, is a beautiful technique, lovely procedure, fantastic results, but there is one, contra one problem. And that is the problem of a high riding or an anomalous vertebral human being. If the CT scan reveals that the pedicle or the pars at C2 is less than about 3.5 millimeters, it is difficult to get a screw of an adequate size in position. In these patients or in patients where you may not be able to adequately reduce the subluxation or displacement of the fracture, a posterior C1, C2 screw fixation is the way to go. Because the C1-C2 screw fixation, as Shitish beautifully showed us, is a method by which you can intraoperatively reduce the displacement. In the good old days, posterior C1-C2 used to be done by wiring. In children, this is an option which you could still do. But bear in mind, when you're doing a posterior C1-C2 wiring, as you tighten, the fracture fragment can displace backwards. If it does, then you can land up with neurologic deficit. To prevent that, what is recommended is putting in wedges of bone between the C1 and C2 arch so that as you tighten, the amount of posterior displacement is limited. So today, surgery for these things are commonplace. However, you must have adequate experience, a proper setup, good CM and good imaging before you go ahead and do this. So with that, I hope that you have gained a lot from this session. I thank the moderator, Dr. Ajay Prasad Shetty, and all the panelists and presenters, Dr. Vishal Purnari, Dr. Srivastar, Dr. Vijay Kumar, Dr. Bharat Dave, Dr. Satish, Dr. Shitij, and Dr. Sajesh for participating in this session. And I think 
I don't know about you people, but I certainly have learned a lot from all these guys. Thank you very much. And I would like to welcome you, announce two seminars. There is an ASI is going to have a pro webinar series, which is directed at orthopedic professionals, postgraduates, and not to necessary spine specialists. This first seminar is going to be held on 17th May at 4 p.m. The topic is approach to intervertebral disc prolapse. So please join us for that. And as I said, the next seminar of the master series is on 7th of June. It will be on congenital craniovertebral anomalies, complex anomalies of the C1, C1, C1 junction. And we will have none other than Dr. Satish taking over the mantle from Ajay Prasad Shetty the next time over. Thank you very much and good day. Thank you, Dr. Ajay. Thank you, Dr. Gaur. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.